So, so welcome everyone who's just joined us. And uh, Shelly, I want to say hello to you. Thank you for hello. being here tonight. And Hi, so, so we're talking about the uh, folks that listen to the St. John Passion on their own this week. We're talking about some of the things they noticed and what, what, what um, they specially um, appreciated. And I just wanted to ask what were some of the most impactful things to you? Also ask if they're getting an echo. For me, so, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I didn't realize, like Christy, I didn't realize that Bach wrote this for, for church. Um, and I had played the piano and took lessons for years and played a lot of Bach. I love the Baroque, but I had no idea that it was, he wrote a lot of music um, for church and for God's glory that you said last mm -hmm. week. And I loved the, um, the different instruments used. Mm -hmm. um, Man, so I think those were the two that. most impactful things. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I don't think I'd ever seen a Baroque oboe before. Mm -hmm. So that <laughs> was cool. Like I loved that 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 aria with the two oboes and the bassoon. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that number. And so it was just yeah, it was fun to see the, the It's a really the special sound. And we're going to I'm going to introduce you tonight to a couple of very unique instruments that Bach used specifically at specific moments in the St. John Passion. Mm -hmm tonight another one which you'll probably mention there was i've never seen it before but on one of the solos there was two they looked like uh something between a viola and a cello it was huge with more than four strings it was at least that's there. exactly the one i'm going to tell you about tonight okay <laughs> yeah I'll wait for that i'm glad you noticed that that's really special okay so is the sound okay for everyone you can hear yep. everybody's yep. doing all right. Okay, now can you see the, what I put in the chat? Because I put something in the chat. I'm hoping you can all see that. Not yet. Oh. No, it 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 disappeared. The history's gone. I think oh, I've tried to do that before too. That back? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to put it in there again. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, you should be able to now see that one. Okay. Yep, there we go. Okay, and then I'm going to copy this one. This is working. Okay. Um, so these are a couple of links that are going to help you tonight. Um, okay. And Shelly, this is partly for you because I know you didn't you didn't come last week. But um, if you want to, uh, we're, what we're going to do with the class is we're going to actually go to a particular website and we're going to listen mm -hmm. to some of the St. John Passion. So I put the link in there and it would be a good idea um, to cue that up here in just a moment. Just wanted to give you that up, up front so you, you can find it easily. So here's what we're going to do. I, I just want to pray to begin uh, our class tonight. That's okay with you all. Oh, all right. Yeah. Lord God, we are just so thankful for the gift of music. And we're thankful and grateful that, that the music that we're going to be learning about and listening to tonight is something that will draw us in to the story of Jesus' passion. And <clears throat> Lord, I just uh, appreciate uh, these people that have come tonight that want to participate and want to learn more uh, and want to draw closer to you th through this music into the story, the story of what you did for us. And I just uh, pray that you would bless this time tonight, make it meaningful for our Lenten devotion. And uh, we just pray that you would be with us, be present with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Amen. I am going to share my screen. And as I do, I just wanted to tell you too that you're welcome to use the chat here comes chris stroop i'm going to admit him um you're welcome to use the chat if you want to ask a question steve is going to be kind of watching the chat for me <laughs> so um he can help me keep track of uh if, if anyone has a, a comment or a question 
So here, what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share that screen and we're going to get started. Okay. So can you all see my, um, my little title yep. page here? <laughs> okay. Um, so yep, we're, we're, um, we're studying the St. John Passion by Bach. And uh, this is mostly for the sake of the folks that will be watching this as a video afterwards. I wanted everyone to have the link where everything can be easily found. And uh, this is a, it's a, you can come back to this. I think Mark's going to leave this up for a while. So um, hopefully this will be something that you can continue to enjoy. Okay. So as I mentioned last time, Sacred art is really about participation. For me, listening to this music is a, is a little bit like, I will call it audio divina. <laughs> so we've all had, <laughs> you know, we've all had lectio divina where we've listened, we listen to the scripture being read and just let it soak into us. And for me, this music by Bach is 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 the same sort of thing, but it's through my you know listening experience, and the purpose I believe of all sacred art is to reveal something about the divine to mm -hmm. us, and at the same time cause something in the d divine in the image of God to be awakened in us. It just invites us to meditate on God and soak that in in a special way. Um, this um, photo here is the what they call the Bach organ at the St. Thomas Kirsha in Leipzig. So this is the church where where he wrote and his this music and where he performed it. And so this is this was not uh, this organ did not exist at the time that he lived. It's it's a replica though of what they think his organ was like. And I also wanted to mention if you all really enjoy this sort of thing, sacred art, I'm really hoping you do, then I want to recommend this book to you. It is called 75 Masterpieces of Christian Art That Every Christian Should Know by Terry Glasby. And uh, it's really great. It's got a lot of visual art and some music and some plays and books. So I really like I really like that book a lot. Um, it's been a blessing to me. Okay, Terry. Yes. Oh, could you repeat the title, please? Sure, sure, sure. Oh, here it is, right here. Oh, oh, oh he's wait, found no. it. He's found it. It's called "75 Masterpieces Every Christian Should Know." It's it's art in the Christian tradition. Great pieces of art. It's really, it's really good. Book. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about Bach's faith and kind of where he was coming from mm -hmm. with um, writing all of this music. And actually the first quote there is from the book that I just showed you. He said, Bach was nothing less than a theologian who worked with a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Um, and uh, one of the things I think was very interesting was that he was a he he really loved the scriptures. He there's a lot of stories of him spending time in the evening reading scripture to his children. He had 21 children, by the way, uh, more than one wife. <laughs> um, yes, no, not at the same not time. At the same time. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, but yes, he was a very diligent father, and his extensive library was equally divided between works on music and theology. He loved studying theology and reading the current, you know, writings of people in the Lutheran tradition in his time. So, so he didn't take it lightly that he was writing music that would not only be beautiful for you to listen to, but would have substance, something of substance in the, in the meaning behind it. Um, he was living about a hundred years after Luther, and he was uh, he was in that following in that Lutheran tradition. But he was also very influenced by 
the personal devotional faith of the pietists and some of the mystics that were living at that time. And I can really hear that in some of the arias, the things um, that he's writing, because he really wants, to, you can really hear him expressing the desire of the personal believer to have a, a deep uh, personal relationship with God. And here's a quote from Bach himself. He said, the aim and final reason for all music should be none else but the glory of God and the refreshing of the soul. Mm -hmm. um, he owned a three volume Bible, uh, which it, it included a, a lot of commentary. That's why it was three volumes uh, from the 17th century theologian, Abraham Kalov. And if you, this is actually, this uh, photograph here is a photo of Bach's personal Bible, which interestingly enough is in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Don't ask me how it got there, <laughs> but it's it's at the um, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, um, and it was a it was kind of a new edition at the time he lived. And Bach was just delighted when he could find like printing errors because he wanted to correct the pre would write little notes in in the margin and correct the errors, and he also would write notes to himself about things that he was particularly inspired by. And this is a note that he wrote, which is near uh, First Chronicles 25. And in this chapter, basically it lists the, the musicians that were appointed to lead Israel's worship. And I think he was kind of getting from this, this is the, this is the, um, kind of the, the beginnings of what worship should be like and and why there's justification for musicians to be, uh, per, you know, working full-time in the church. So, yeah, he wrote, he wrote in the corner here, this chapter is the true foundation of all God-pleasing church music. Okay, so what does this have to do with the St. John Passion? Well, I think what we've just talked about provides a context for what he was doing with this piece of music. And um, this particular quote that I've copied here is really the center of the passion, the center of this whole entire piece. It's this chorale, number 22. It's considered the, the central theme. And if you read these words, Here's what he's trying to work through with this music. Through your prison, son of God, must freedom come to us. Your cell is the throne of grace, the sanctuary of all the righteous. For if you had not undergone servitude, our slavery would have been eternal. Mm. Um, Amen. Yes, yeah, so you can see the kind of the, the the two things he's talking about here. He's talking about what Jesus had to undergo, and he's also talking about the impact it has on us. Mm -hmm. And this photo of the piece of music right here is that. Remember, I we talked last time about that turbulent music, the sound of the. Mm. the you can tell something is going to happen. It's right in the first movement. Well, this is a picture of that music. And you can even see just the picture of the notes. It looks like, oh my gosh, something's going on here. <laughs> pretty, pretty stressful. <laughs> so you're going to see the, in the story, as he's, as he's portraying it, he's going to be talking a lot about darkness and light and the battle. Okay. All right. So, to me, this music shows me Christ's passion from two different perspectives. First, there's me looking up at Jesus on the cross, kind of like that man in the, in the painting here at Jesus' feet, looking up, looking up at Jesus. It's me looking up considering the depth of my sin. 
But the other perspective is from Jesus' eyes, Jesus looking down at us. And that makes me consider the depth of God's grace. Mm -hmm. So those are the two, like the two angles here. And in, in my mind, the cross of Christ is, it's almost unbearable to even meditate on, even think about it. But simultaneously, it's our only hope. And it's the place where the greatest ugliness in the world intersects the greatest beauty that the world has ever known. Uh, and by the way, this painting, I looked around to try to find something uh, for you, but this painting actually was uh, hanging in one of the churches in Leipzig. So Bach might have seen this. And um, it was from a considerably early time period, maybe about 100 years before him. But it made me think about, you know, was were th these sort of images inspiring to Bach as he was thinking about, how can I be like an artist? How can I be like a painter who's going to make this story come alive for someone? Only instead of using paint, I'm going to use music. All right. So how did he... How did he paint with music? Well, one of the things he did, it's called, the name of it is text painting, where you take a text, you know, the, the words, and you make it come alive by choosing certain things about what you're going to do with the melody or the rhythm, or choosing, like Al was noticing, what instruments you're using to make a certain feeling come through the music. And so now I wanted to kind of explain to you in a little bit more detail some examples of exactly how Bach did that. Um, and he was the master. He was really a master of this. Um, I can say that where I went to college when I was working on my master's degree, there was a class um, at the doctoral level that was an entire semester that students were taking on just the St. Matthew Passion. And that's because there's so much in it, so much in it that was representing, you know, Bach using certain things to represent things that his listeners would have heard. Like that painter, uh, painting that painting. Okay, so I want you, as we're talking through this, I want you to think about the contrast of darkness and light and what, what, what how Bach is portraying that in the music okay so first we're going to talk through it just a bit and then we're going to actually go and listen to some of these things in the music the first thing is Jesus flogging you can hear it in uh, the voice part how the voice just uh, I mean it sounds like flogging it's amazing um, and that's going to be in one of the recitatives in number 18. Then right after that, okay, this is what Al was talking about. What are those instruments? They look kind of like a cross between a viola and a cello. Well, they are. Their their name is violas d'amore. One would be called a viola d'amore, and two is violas d'amore. <laughs> and the d'amore, you can kind of, you know, that's kind of, that's Italian. Do you know what that word means? Amore? Love. Love, yes. So they were associated with love, right? representing a message you know, that was associated with love. And what you're going to hear is right after the flogging, um, you're going to hear this sweet, sweet sound of these two string instruments that are going to represent... Uh, the soul contemplating on this terrible thing that's just happened. And it's a beautiful contrast. So you're going to hear light and darkness. Um, let me see. I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to actually show you, I'm going to show you my instrument back behind me because it's kind of related to the viola da gamba. Okay, the next thing is, in this, the very next aria, he uses the same two instruments and the, the words, the text includes the word rainbow. And it's just amazing because Bach, will he makes the melody go up and down. And it's this arching shape 
that really when you think about it, it's a, it's, he's showing you a rainbow in the music. And if you could actually look at the music, you would see it in the notes. So the musicians are seeing that as they're playing. So it's, that's pretty cool. And then later on, um, later on in the story, Jesus has just proclaimed, it is finished. He's just died. And then Bach has probably the most difficult thing ever to do as a composer is how do you, what do you say about that? How do you depict that? And what he chose to do was give those words, it is finished, kind of a double meaning. So you, you're going to hear the sadness of this moment being portrayed by the other unique instrument called the viola da gamba, which has a really mournful kind of sound. And then in that same aria, he does something really drastic, which he never does. I don't think he ever does any other time. He he juxtaposes that with a very triumphant announcement that the hero has conquered. And he's done that in the same movement. So you're going to hear that. So think about that contrast between darkness and light. All right. And then finally, when the curtain of the temple is torn, the earth shakes and the graves are opened. Every time the voice part announces these things happening, you're going to hear something happening in the, in the accompaniment that sounds like what he's describing. Okay? Hmm. So now I, want, uh, I wanted just to show you, because I have an instrument behind me that I wanted to get down. Um, this, let me show you. This is a viola da gamba. Hopefully you can see That's this. That's beautiful. Um, wow. Kind of, it's like the ancestor of the, the oh, you, he wants you to see the top. The ancestor of the modern string family. You can see it's got frets on it. Mm -hmm. It's like a guitar. It's got six strings. Well, actually, mine's got five. <laughs> One broke. <laughs> um, but And it's about the same size as a cello. This, it's, you can see it's a little different shape than the modern string family. It's got sloping sides and like a C shape here instead of the pointed corners of the violin and the cello. So this was like the, the instrument that um, was very very popular and it was kind of a it was kind of associated with antiquity and um, something something ancient something from the past it was almost going out of fashion during box time but he loved the sound of this and um, he used it quite effectively. This is one of the most famous moments where it's actually being used is in the St. John Passion. And then the viola, viola d'amore, it's almost in the same family. It's very similar shape, only small enough where you can hold it under your chin. Um, it had wire strings from what I understand. So it had a very shimmery kind of sound. And some people, um, some people say that some that when Bach used this, he was trying to represent a halo around Jesus as he was talking. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about the viola de more is that um, it would sometimes have sympathetic strings. So that's the reason why, um, Al, when you saw all the pegs on it, probably like 14 pegs, uh, maybe 10 or yeah, 10 or 14 pegs, because there were strings, five or seven strings that you could play on with a bow, and then there were sub, uh, matching strings of the same pitch that went underneath the bridge, and they would vibrate sympathetically, so it would make this sound like a shimmer, mm -hmm. and that's pretty cool. I was looking at this, uh, kind of trying to zoom in on those instruments, watching this performance, and they don't; these don't have those sympathetic strings. So I did a little research, and I found out that it was not tradition for the in the Lutheran for the the Lutheran tradition when this instrument was used in these 
types of pieces like the passions that they were they were different they didn't have the sympathetic strings but mm. they had a really unique sound all right now are you ready to go listen to this a little bit we've talked about the piece some and yeah. i've shown you what to listen for so now is when you're going to want to queue up your um your website okay and i'm hoping that you've found that website so what i can do is i can show you really quickly where we're going to go this is my website that you're looking at and i wanted to show you that remember like we did this last time you can go up here on the right hand corner and you can see there's a menu where you can drop down it'll, it'll give you all the numbers of the different movements so what we're going to do right now is I want you to queue up 18C 18C and if you've got your text and translation handy you want to find out find where that begins number number 18 is like like about a third two-thirds of the way down in number 18 oh yeah don't play it yet and actually when you do play it all of you, almost all of you are muted already, but be sure you mute yourself when you begin to play it because then we won't have that feedback coming through for everyone at the same time. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to 18C all the way through number 20. So you're going to listen to 18C, 19, and 20. So then you're going to hear, you're going to number 20 has the rainbow in it. And number 19 is the response of the soul. What contemplate, as I contemplate what has just happened, watching Jesus be flogged. All right, are you ready to do it? So we're going to go, we're going to go listen to that. It's going to take about nine minutes. Then come back and we'll talk about that together. All right, I'm going to so meet myself. Terry, yes. Terry, I'm having trouble finding it. Is there any way I can talk to you and I'm on the website but I'm having trouble finding it oh that, okay yes possibly what you need to do is possibly you need to is there a search bar you possibly need to type in St. John Passion well I'm on all of Bach yes okay have you found okay. the St. John Passion within that because there are a bunch of different pieces on okay. that okay let me try that okay okay there I go you got it? Okay, so then yep. drop down. You found the menu and you can find 18C. Okay, thank you. You're so quick, Shelly. Thank you. Well, I think I got it. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I think you're muted. I'm not finding it either. Where We found it last week, but where is hmm. where's the um, hmm. find 18C, the menu? Oh, the, the, menu. the menu is on the little, there's a little you like a yellow box in the top right hand corner of the window. Yeah, it's not there. <gasps> You're kidding me. I think you have to hit play. Oh, you, hit you play at the bottom, then then the menu shows up there at the top. Right. right. Yep. Play, hit Does that the play? work? Yes, hit the play, and then the menu shows up. Oh, there is oh right there. Okay. 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 Thank you, Chris. You're yep. so helpful. <laughs> all right. I was going crazy. I think if we've all found it, okay. okay. Let's let's all mute ourselves and then go listen to 18C through 20, and then come back. When you come back, please uh, ma mention back or something like that in the chat so I know you're back. Okay, great. You at least you found this website and you can go to it again because it's an awesome resource. And um, as we're only uh, able to have time in this class to do just snippets, you know, I want you to, I want to wet your whistle so that you will want to go back and listen to the whole thing uh, uninterrupted. All right, so I think people are coming back now. Um, as you're coming back, you can, you can unmute yourself. And then I wanted to, uh, get get some feedback from you. How did you um, how did you like that? What did you think? Mm. 
Did you hear the flogging? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In number 18? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what did you think about the contrast of that with the sound of those two stringed instruments, the viola, dum, violas d'amore? Mm -hmm. Striking. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty mm -hmm. cool. Um, okay. Very distinct. All right. So if you didn't hear all of that or you weren't sure, go back again uh, at another time, listen again, and see if you can like let that soak in really think about think about what the contrast between that the light and the darkness happening there mm -hmm. okay so all right i want to i would like to listen to one more excerpt let's try to see if we can go navigate that challenging website a little bit um so i think the secret is you you find the play button Actually, if you've already played it, your menu should still be there and up in the right-hand corner. Okay, what I'd like to listen to now is number 30, where Bach is given the most, most challenging moment to try to set to music. And it's the moment when Jesus has just said, it is finished. What what significant words, what amazing, an amazing concept to even begin to portray. And so I'd like, to, I'd like you to hear how he does that and how he gives us the really cool contrast between the sadness of that moment that he uses, uh, where he uses the viola da gamba and the triumph of Judah, the hero of Judah who has just conquered. And that's, we're going to listen to number 30. Um, and I'd like to go a little bit further. How do you How do you all feel? Would you like to listen to the graves being opened to? And that kind of that cool dramatic moment where the, um, um, all right. All right, you want to hear an earthquake? <laughs> A Bach version of an earthquake. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go to number 30. So find your website there. Find the menu up in the right-hand corner. Scroll down to number 30. And what I want you to listen for is the sound of the viola da gamba that's traditionally used in this at this time period to portray great emotion. Shelley, are you finding it there? Oops, you're muted now. So tell me what you're finding. I wish I could come through the screen and reach in there and just help you do this. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. I found it and then I lost it, but I'll find my way. I'll find my way. All right. So. All right. I need to come I, over I, to your house. We need to have tea. And I know. Listen I know. <laughs> okay. So number 30, does everybody else have it there ready? Okay. We're going to listen to 30 and then go all the way down to um, 33. We're going to, well, really be cool to listen to 34 too. So if you were willing, we're going to listen to 30 all the way down through 34. Stop it when when it just just about to play 35. Okay, we're going to hear it is finished. And I, what I want you to listen for is um, in aria number 32, the choir is going to be asking a lot of questions. Let me ask, am I free from death? Can I, through your pain and death, inherit the kingdom of heaven? Has the redemption of the whole world arrived? And listen to the answer of Jesus. He gets the last word. All right? So I'm going to mute myself. We're going to go over to 30 and listen all the way 30, 31, 32, 33, and 34. Okay? Okay. I just realized I misspoke. Something I told you about Aria... Number 32, I think I said to you, the choir was going to be asking a lot of questions. And I actually, that's not correct because 
Now, one of the things that's a little bit confusing as you as you listen, and you have to listen to it a couple times before you really kind of get this, is that sometimes the words are repeated. I hope I should have said you yeah. told you about that before. <laughs> sometimes a line is repeated, and you can sort of feel like you're losing track of the the flow. But maybe you notice that in the text here, the the choir is actually the offset part down at the bottom mm -hmm. so remember i told you last week that the role of the individual singer in the arias the 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 arias are representing the individual believer and how they're responding to the story whereas the choir is representing the church and how the church see, is seeing the story and representing the story and as I was listening, I realized, because I wanted to make sure you saw, it's not the church that's asking the questions. It's the individual believer. The individual soul is asking, am I free from death? Can I, through your pain and death, inherit the kingdom of heaven? Actually, the church is saying, telling what Jesus has done. The church is proclaiming, who Jesus is and what he has done. Did you notice who had the last word on that aria though? Jesus silently bowed his head, bowed his head and silently said, yes. Jesus was giving the answer to all of those questions, yes. And he had the very last word. I just love that. I think that's my favorite aria in the whole thing. Okay, and then did you hear the temple curtain being torn and the graves uh, earth shaking all the trembling going on um that's pretty awesome text painting going on in that story yeah, okay that so now what i want to do is um we've listened to just snippets portions of it um just so that you can have a picture in your mind uh, like a, a little bit of a, a window into what bach was thinking and how he was trying to use the skills that he had to portray this story in the best way possible. And um, I'm gonna share my screen again because I want to show you something here. Ah, here's where we were a second ago. Okay, so we talked about all of the text painting. And I want to show you an, an, the next thing here. So remember in the beginning when we talked last week, I explained that the whole idea on Bach's mind was that he would help the believer to remember the story, to enter into the story, and then to respond to it personally. And, well, I guess my question for you is, has, has his music helped you draw something new from the story maybe that you hadn't noticed before or experienced it a new way or think about it more deeply i sh i really hope so i hope so and i hope that you will be um you know have it have maybe a, a a love for this now that will bring you back to it something that you might enjoy uh coming back to maybe in future years, uh, during Holy Week or during Lent. Um, it, it definitely has for me, and I wanted to share a, a story with you about that because today, believe it or not, is Bach's birthday. I thought that was pretty cool that we're doing this class t today on Bach's birthday. He would be 336 years old today. <laughs> And okay. um, this photo that I have here is, is actually a statue of Bach that is standing right outside of the Thomas Kirsche in Leipzig. And when I was a student, I mentioned to you that I was um, studying in Amsterdam. And I, I told you last week about my experience with hearing this music for the first time in the, in the dark, cold, winter of the Netherlands um, 
But I also, that year, I had a chance to go with a choir. I was actually not singing in the choir. I was playing in the orchestra accompanying the choir. We traveled to Leipzig that year because it was, let's see, it was another anniversary, and I can't remember which one. It was 19, 1985, so that would have been the 300th, 300th anniversary of Bach's birth. And there was a, a, a church music festival and I was standing in this very place, looking at this statue, and I also walked inside. I, I was just amazed as a student, thinking, wow, like Bach was a real person. It kind of proves it. He really was here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, I was walking around inside the building thinking, gosh, this is, this is the place where, where he lived and worked, and he played music right here in this very room. And then as I was just thinking that, I happened to look down on the floor and I was in the area where the choir would have been. Right there on the floor, there's this huge brass plaque with his dates on it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm standing on his grave right now. This is crazy. <laughs> um, but it, it, was a, it was a moment for me as a young musician, I kind of had a reckoning, I guess, and a, a little bit of an awakening because what what I was aware of was that at the time that Bach lived, he he took every bit of skill that he had. He took all the experience that had come before, all of the the uh, musicians that had lived before him that he learned from. He took the tradition that he inherited, and he dedicated his life to giving everything he had to tell God's story, which is the story that we are a part of. And that made me realize that Bach was, was an everyday saint, and I can be that too. So I just want to ask us tonight, how can we, in our time where we live, how can we share the greatest story through our lives using whatever he's given to us to, to, do, to, to become part of that? Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that moment in my life. And I wanted to read the final, the words of the final chorale, the last movement of the St. John Passion. Um, because I think it's so beautiful, and I think it, it expresses beautifully the, the desire, um, not only of Bach, but of every Christian. At that day, wake me from death, so that my eyes may see you in all joy, O Son of God, my Savior and throne of grace. Lord Jesus Christ, hear me. I will praise you eternally. May we all do that very, very same thing. So, Amen. yes. So that is all I have for you tonight. <laughs> I really hope that you have been blessed by participating in this. And I hope that you will take joy in listening to the St. John Passion. And maybe in a future year, oh, it would be so delightful to gather together and uh, actually watch the whole thing, maybe on a screen, yep. maybe in person. Uh, wouldn't that be a delightful, a fun experience? Mm -hmm. So I wish you all a very blessed Lent and Holy Week. May uh, the, the death and, and passion of Jesus be even more meaningful to you this year. All right. Thank you, Terry. Thanks. God bless Thank you, you Terry. all. Amen. Thank you.